come together and give God praise for what he did on last night. And how many are ready to receive a word today? Come on, lift your hands and praise him. Come and let us sing, come and let us sing, come and let us sing to the King of Kings. Come and let us sing, come and let us sing, come and let us sing to the King of Kings. Come on, sing with me. Come and let us sing, come and let us sing. Oh, come and let us sing to the King of Kings.
of the Lord tonight. As you're opening your Bibles with me as we return back again to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 9. Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 9. The apostle speaking to us and simply saying, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if, everybody say if, <clears throat> if sets the condition, if we faint not, and we want to continue on that, and let us not be weary, part two. Set your Bibles down a moment and lift your hands to the Lord. And let us just worship him just a moment. Mm -hmm. Yes, we love you, Jesus. Yes, we love you. We love you, Father. We glorify you. We thank you for just simply being God. We love you for who you are. We give you glory. We give you honor. We tell you thank you. None like 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 you. Hallelujah. None like you. We thank you just for who you are right now. Hey, glory. Hey, glory. Hey, glory. Hallelujah, just because of who you are. 
just because of who you are. Hallelujah. Would you shake hands with a few people and smile at somebody and tell them I'm glad you're here tonight? <clears throat> Come on, you might be the only smile that somebody's seen all day long. Thank you, Jesus. So glad you're here in the house of the Lord. The Lord bless you. Amen. So grateful that you're here. We want to honor the founder, Bethel. So glad that he's here tonight, Bishop Weeks. Appreciate you, sir. Thank God for Bishop Weeks. Amen. I have uh, many fond memories of Bishop Weeks growing up in the council and hearing him teach. I'll never forget him teaching from Romans chapter 5 on moreover many, many years ago. But he was such a great teacher. You may be seated. Thank you. He was such a great teacher, and we thank God for Bishop Weeks and the work that he's done. And to the pastor of this house, Dr. Gwendolyn Weeks, we're so grateful to her. Amen. Thank God for her. The Bible commands us to give honor to whom honor is due. We're so glad to have Pastor Emmanuel here tonight and Pastor Lolita. Would you put your hands together and thank God for them tonight. Amen. Of the worship center of Jesus Christ. And to all of you, the saints of the Most High God, we are so glad that we are in fellowship. Somebody say one more time. And so let's continue now to the book of Galatians. We have, uh, we're back in Galatians chapter 4. Uh, let's just quickly go over some highlights so that we can just be refreshed uh, to where the Apostle Paul is dealing and what he's talking to us about that's going to lead us to the climax of understanding of let us not be weary. In chapter 1, we dealt with the fact that the Apostle Paul was dealing and establishing his apostleship. He opens up with salutations, greetings, but then he quickly gets right down to the subject matter that the church has been moved from what they first were established in. And he gets back down to the point of saying, I don't care if an angel preached to you. Any other gospel than what I've already preached, let him be a what? Let him be accursed. And he repeats that again in verse 9 of chapter 1, being very emphatic over this. In chapter 2, Paul then enters in and starts to tell us again about his apostleship, how that he was 14 years a man away from the brethren. He had been journeying for 14 years, I should say, and how he was in the deserts of Arabia, how God ministered, spoke to him, and because of who he is, he then could meet the apostle Peter rank for rank and rebuke him because he was to blame, because he was causing dissension and division within the body of Christ. He ends that chapter by saying, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Grace is meant to unify us as a body, and when we will not submit to that grace because we are dealing so strongly with our flesh, we frustrate grace. Then in chapter 3, and I think we need to just to take a moment and look again at chapter 3 because, well, the apostle has really come right down to the core of the issue in chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I told you before now, Jesus, the apostles, they call you names. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And then uh, G, uh, the apostle Paul starts off in right verse 1 and says, O foolish Galatians. Paul and Timothy talks to the women and said, called them silly women. Mm -hmm. uh, they would just label things for the way that they were. They were not concerned about being politically correct. They were concerned about pleasing God and the validity of the word of God. Can you say amen to that? And so Paul begins off by saying, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? In other words, who has put you under some sort of spell, some sort of cantation or incantation, who has twisted your way of thinking that what you first have learned, you have turned away from that. I need to stop right here just a moment. 
Because Paul is very concerned over the fact that their minds are twisted. Can I say why a lot of us are struggling? You have a satanic point of view of God. And that's why a lot of you don't want to work for the Lord. You're afraid to get up in front of people. You act like God is actually trying to punish you by calling you to do something. That's satanic. When rather than having the understanding that God is actually giving you a privilege and an honor. Mm -hmm. Tell somebody it's a privilege to work for the Lord. Tell them it's an honor to work for the Lord. And see, some of you try to find every legal and illegal loophole that you can in order to get out of working for the Lord. That means that you're having a satanic point of view. Some of you have this satanic point of view of God that he's just always out to get you. Do one thing wrong, he's going to torture you. That he's sitting there like an old man with a lightning bolt in his hand going, are you having fun yet? And you say, well, yeah. And he says, well, cut it out. You, you have this concept of him that is not biblically true. Why would he die for you and then seek to destroy you? That make his own death in vain. Don't you understand anything that he's asking of you to do is for your good. It is for your blessing. God does not want worship because God is on an ego trip and likes to hear his name. God wants worship because that's for your benefit. That's for my benefit. Praise, that's for our benefit. That connects us to the divine source. And so that's why Paul's concerned. He's saying your minds are getting twisted here. You're starting to think opposite to God. And listen to what he goes on to say. Verse 2. This only what I have learned of you. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now made perfect in the flesh? Now, now uh, this, this part is mandatory as we go into chapter 4. Because it is this theme that Paul is going to carry the rest of the way through the book. He's going to tell them that the real problem that you're having is that you're too strong in your flesh. And because you are analyzing by the flesh, you are feeling that the Judaic law that was laid down is the proper approach now to God, even though you were told otherwise. See, whenever you don't really submit by your spirit, your flesh will find another route to God. And it will decide what it thinks God will accept. Well, you know, God wouldn't be upset about this. This is no big deal. This is no problem. God doesn't mind me, amen, out in, in some nightclub and dancing to stuff. God, God's got no problem with that. Why, why would God be concerned about that? And so your flesh will start to devise these concepts that it is permissible for you to do some stuff that God is really not with. Hold your space just a moment so you can see something. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, um, verse 1. In fact, I'll really just look at verse 1 right now. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Hear the apostle talk about this. You've got to remember that in, in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews, the apostle has just gone through the hall of fame of faith. And now he is going to make reference in verse 1 back to that hall of fame as he enters into his dissertation in chapter 12 of Hebrews. Verse 1, he says this. He said, I want you to lay aside every weight. Now, uh, before he talks about that, he said, I want you to see that we have a great cloud, someone shout, of witnesses. He's making reference back to chapter 11. Now he says, I need you to lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and I need you to run this race, everyone shout, with patience. So now he's telling you there are two categories that God looks for you to lay aside. That is weights and sins. Here's the problem that we have. If we look in the word and we don't see thou shalt not, we assume it means thou shalt. Well, I don't see nowhere the, where the scripture says I can't do this. So what's the problem? Why can't I do this? Well, because Paul's explaining. Some things are weights. Not everything that God asks you to lay down is a sin. 
We think if it's a sin, okay, fine. But if it's not a sin, why can't I do it? I'll tell you why, because Paul's telling you some stuff is weights. Some things weigh you down from running the race with patience. And so there, and, and, and we might as well get clarification on this because when we deal with weights, we deal with things with God that God will let one person do that God won't let another person do. I'm going to walk word. I'm going to walk word. Don't worry about it. I'm going to walk word because the reason why many of you are struggling is because you want this fairness of what you think should be right across the board. Well, if she can't do it, you know, or if she can do it, why can't I do it? Well, because it has to do with divine design. It has to do with God knowing your, your frailties, your weaknesses. And so what might be your weakness may not be my weakness. And therefore, what may be a problem to you may not be a problem to me and vice versa. So we see this in, in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis chapter 12, we see that Abraham goes down into Egypt. Watch this. When he goes down there, God knows that when this man goes down there, he's going to pick up Hagar, the Egyptian. He's going to start the Arab nation, who we are still having troubles with today. That's how far reaching his mistake was. God doesn't say a word. Isaac gets ready to go down to Egypt, and God looks at him and says, no. Abraham, you can go. Even though you're going to go down there and make some mistakes. He even went down there and lied. He told a half truth. He said, Sarah's my sister. That was half true. They have the same father, not the same mother. That's a half truth. And, and God knew he was going to do all of that in his foreknowledge, and God never said a word. Isaac gets ready to go. God says no. That's why there's some stuff you're going to watch other people do, and God's going to look at you and say, if I even think you're dreaming it, I'll slap you. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, because sometimes what it is is God, God knows he knows what you can handle and what you cannot handle. And so that's why God says it's permissible for one. It's not permissible for another. This is why for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are, they are the sons of God. Why don't you lift your hands again and just worship him a moment in this house. Come on. Give him some glory just a moment. Uh, glory, 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 glory. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, yes, yes. Parents, we do the same things because we know one child is better at doing something than another child. One child may be more responsible than the other child. So we'll let them do it while we tell the other child, no, 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 you haven't proven yourself there, or that's not something that's your strong point. That's not wise for you to do. That's God. All right? So God does not do these things to play favorites. God does these things to protect us. See, when you get this twisted mentality, you see God in some wrong manner. You always see God in some form of out to get you. Let me show you biblically. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Romans chapter 8, verse 7. The reason why many of you are struggling is because you have allowed the devil to convince you that God is trying to curtail your fun. Uh-huh. Yeah. See, see, sometimes what you've got to do is... Get your eyes opened by the Spirit and start really looking at what the devil calls fun. Well, let's go out and let's get drunk. Mm, that's a lot of fun. Huh. Okay. Maybe it is. And then what you discover is you're looking further at this. Folk don't remember what they did. Folk wake up in places they don't even know how they got there. People start telling you stuff that you did. You don't have no recollection of it at all. Some folk end up in jail and don't even know how they got there or why they got there. Oh, this is fun. And even if that doesn't happen to you, the next morning, the hangover starts in. You, 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 you become good friends with the toilet where people put their behinds, you got your face. Oh, this is fun. Mm -hmm. See, that's why God's simply trying to keep you from the humiliation of these things. 
And you're acting like he's trying to keep you from fun. See, that's a twisted mentality. That's a satanic concept of him. And that's why you need right understanding. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 7. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, for the carnal mind is enmity against God. Everybody say enmity. Enmity against God. It is not subject to the laws of God. Neither indeed can it be. Verse 8. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now back up to verse 7 because we've got to look at that word enmity. That word enmity means hostile. Your carnal mind, my carnal mind, is hostile to God. Now understand what the Bible means by carnal mind. Carnal mind means that your reasonings and your feelings are not being influenced by the Spirit of God and the Word of God. That's what the carnal mind is. It means that your reasonings and your feelings are being influenced by your five senses and by the laws of this material world. All right? So that's the carnal mind. Enmity means it's hostile. Your carnal mind always seeks to blame God. Always. Whether directly or indirectly, always seeks to blame God. Always seeks to call things God's problem. It is God that's behind this one way or the other. That's why you have to crucify that carnal mind. Can you say amen to that? Come on, lift your hands just a moment again and worship him. And let's just begin to let that worship pour forth. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. Come on, this is why God tells you don't listen to your carnal mind. Now, the reason why some of you are so struggling is because you are ruled by your carnal mind. And so all you know is what you don't want to do. God tells you, well, I don't want to do that. You can be, even be asked why. I don't know, I just don't want to do that. You know God's asking you to do something, and all you respond with is, I don't want to do that. You're in your carnal mind. Back up to verse 6, Romans chapter 8. Now look at verse 6. Listen to Paul state what happens with your carnal mind. Romans chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is... Let's take a moment with this now. Death. When Paul here is mentioning death, he's not just talking about death in the hereafter. He's talking about death now also. So in other words, when you operate, you can always tell when you're operating in your carnal mind because you always end up with death. Death to your joy, sadness. Death to your peace, confusion. Death to your faith, doubt. Death to your love, fear. Remember that love is not, remember that fear is not the opposite to faith. It is the opposite to love. Verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Perfect love cast out fear because fear torments. And he that feareth has not been made perfect in love. That word perfect doesn't mean flawless. It means mature. You're not a spiritual adult. You're not entered into the love relationship in an adult manner. So what Paul tells you is when you Operate in your carnal mind, you can always tell because you're going to end up confused. Too much analyzation breeds confusion. And many of you are walking in confusion, not knowing the voice of the Lord, because you're always trying to figure out what God is doing. Now, let me tell you how God views that when you try to figure out his mind with your carnal mind. That's like a two-year-old trying to figure out quantum theory. It's just not going to happen. In fact, can I go further and tell you that God actually finds it to be very arrogant. The fact that you actually think you could figure out the plans of the Almighty with your carnal mind. How 
dare you give that much credit to a carnal mind? And the reason why God tells you you can't is because God's telling you, I know you and I know your limitations and I know your abilities and the carnal mind doesn't have that ability. Now you understand 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. I'm looking at the latter portion of the verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. The latter portion of the verse. Listen to what the apostle talks on now. Amen. Again, the apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. The latter portion of the verse. Paul says this. For we have the mind of Christ. Well, what do you mean? The mind of Christ is composed of two things. It's composed of the Spirit of God and the Word of God. It is the Spirit of God that activates the Word of God to show us how to properly use that Word into our situations. The reason why many of you are struggling is because you take your carnal mind and try to understand the Word. You try to apply the reasonings and deductions of your carnal mind to the word of the Lord. That doesn't work. I don't care how you were trained in university. You have got to watch it now. I know in our society, we are trained to learn by challenging everything and asking questions to everything. Now, God doesn't mind you asking questions. It's the spirit that you ask in that God's got the problem with. Parents, you understand it. If your child asks you a question, you can deal with that. But if they ask you a question like you're stupid, like you don't know what you're talking about, like why did you make such a dumb move, uh-huh, you can just feel your hand lifting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, you can just feel it. Why? Because they, they, they're challenging in an, a, a wrong manner with their questions. Now, that's the way it is with God. Now, you've got to recognize this. You may ask God a question, but that doesn't mean God's always going to give you the answer that you want to hear. The disciples asked God a question in Acts chapter 1. They said, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? God looked at them and said, it is not for you to know. In other words, it's none of your business. He answered them now, not necessarily what they wanted to hear. So God, sometimes he will indeed answer you, not always maybe what your flesh wants to hear. Can I tell you why some of you right now are not getting answers from the Lord? You're seeking the face of God. You're asking God for direction and clarification. Which way do I go? What do I do? I want to tell you why some of you are not getting answers. The reason is, is because God's waiting for you to submit your flesh. Hmm. See, God understands if he answers you and your flesh is not under control, your flesh will rebel. Now, do you remember what God said? 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. The, the prophet Samuel is dealing with Saul. 22, 23. He tells, says to him, uh, what's the meaning of the bleeding of the sheep? And, and what's the meaning of these things that I'm hearing? Saul says that, that, that the people have saved the best of the herds to sacrifice to the Lord. Now listen to Samuel. Has the Lord delight in fat offerings or in burnt offerings and in the fat of calves? He said, for obedience is, he said, to hearken than the fat of rams. He said, for rebellion is as the sin of See, some of you don't understand. The reason why God's not answering you, it's for your benefit because he knows you're going to rebel and now you're going to be found in witchcraft. So it's better for your sake that God doesn't answer you. Witchcraft is the serving of Satan. So it's better that God does not answer you and gives you a chance to get your flesh under submission first. See, faith says I'll submit first and hear what you say afterwards. Carnal mind says, I got to know what you're saying first before I submit. I got to know what I'm submitting to. Faith says, I know you. Therefore, whatever I'm submitting to is best for me. Carnal mind says, well, you don't exactly got it like that in my book. So I got to know what I'm submitting to. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, I submit to you. Say, and that with joy. 
Oh, some of y'all struggled on that last part. Some of y'all, yeah, bye, 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 some of y'all, uh-huh. Some of y'all struggled on that last part there. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, okay, I can, all right, all right, y'all. Mm -mm 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 -mm. All right. Isaiah chapter 1, 19, you took me here, you took me here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19, because I want you to see this again. We, we discussed it before. We got to discuss it again because you got to see this. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 19. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. Now, see what happens to a lot of you? You're obedient. You're not willing. You're asked to do song service. <sighs> I guess if I have to. See, you're obedient, but you're not willing. You're asked to usher. You're asked to do something. And you do all with attitude. You make it very clear that you don't want to do none of this. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows there's something you don't want to do. But you're just being obedient. God said, newsflash, you ain't reaping nothing. You ain't eating nothing, not from my hand. So if you're not eating from my hand, guess whose hand you're eating from? So if you be, everybody say willing and obedient. Not just obedient, willing. Did you notice how God puts attitude before action? Because you can do the right action, but if you don't have the right attitude in the action, then the action is wrong. Why? Because this is worship. The word worship means to serve. It's one of its definitions. It means to serve. And then the Bible says, serve the Lord with gladness. You ain't supposed to be acting like God's spanking you. You're not supposed to be acting like this is a punishment because God called you to do something. You're supposed to look at God and say, thank you that you would count me worthy. You could have called anybody you wanted to call, but you chose me. And I just want to tell you, just want to say thank you. You could have blessed anybody you wanted to bless. There are billions of people in this world. You could have blessed anybody you wanted to bless. You chose me. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't have to do it, but you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I'm looking at the latter portion of the verse. Even though the first part, he says, I want you to learn to give. Don't give out of necessity. Don't give grudgingly. Necessity means don't give out of obligation. Grudgingly means don't do it with a bad attitude. Pastor, somebody's asking for more money. You know, the church, church folk are just funny. Just funny. Any other place other than church, church people expect to pay. You don't expect to call a plumber and not pay. But in church, you think everything's supposed to be free. You want to char they charge $5 for the CD. Well, why so much? Y'all just all up into money. We ain't supposed to be all up in money in church. Church shows is funny. You spend more, you'll spend five dollars easily at McDonald's and won't give it up for the eternal word of God. Want to complain that the CD's five dollars? That's too much money. Some of y'all just funny. You just funny. You go get a Thompson chain. You see a hundred bucks on the. Ooh, that kind of expensive, ain't it? Hundred bucks for a Bible. Woo! Y'all slap down six hundred easily for an iPhone. And talk about a hundred bucks is too much for a Bible. That's why some of y'all got picture Bibles. Little cartoon version. Because you don't want to spend too much money on a Bible. Amen. Uh -huh. See, it's a way of thinking. Thinking is incorrect. See, because God knows whatever it is you value, that's where you put your money. Why? Because money, you've got to understand how money works in our society. What happens is when you work 40 hours a week, time is being spent. Time is something that once it is spent, it never can be spent again. How you just spent your time a minute ago, you never can re-spend it. It is spent for the rest of your life. Therefore, they give you money in exchange for how much they say your time is worth. 
Money, therefore, represents your time, your blood, your tears, and your sweat, how you have spent your life, a period of time of your life. That's why God asks for your money. Because now this is a sacrifice. Now you're giving of your blood, your sweat, your tears, your time, how you spent your life. That's why when God can see you'll give more money to a clown than you will to him. You'll give more money to Ronald to get a happy meal for your child or to get something you like. You'll give more in a tip than you will give in an offering. You give more than an outfit, people say, ooh, that's kind of expensive. Don't you think, well, it might be, but I like it. I'm paying it. You'll pay more for some technological gadget. Uh huh. And if we asked for that money in an offering, you'd be looking at us like we had five heads. See, it's the way of thinking. Don't you understand that when you're giving offerings and you're sowing into the kingdom, you're sowing into the things of God, you're telling God, you're worth my time, my tears, my blood, my sweat, how I spend my life because it's in you I live, I move, and I have my being. You're the reason why I have the power to do what I'm able to do. And if you didn't give me power, I wouldn't be able to do it. And I wouldn't have no money. Those of you that walk up into God's faith talking about, I work hard for my money and I ought to be able to spend it any way I want to. God says open up your eyes and understand unless I help you, you don't have the strength. Take a look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and in verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 18. In fact, let me back up to verse 10. First, verse 10, this one's free. This one's on the house. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 10. Hey, listen to this. When thou art eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God. I know you're supposed, many of us understand you're supposed to bless your food before you eat it. Did you know you're supposed to bless it after? You're supposed to thank God after you've eaten? Uh-huh. You say, well, why is that? Simple, my friend, because a lot of folk who eat, number one, can't hold it down. Other folk who eat, they don't have the enzymes to digest it, so they never get full. Other folks don't have enough food on their plate to make them full. So the fact that you can eat and be full, thou shalt bless the Lord thy God. Does anybody know what it is to eat and be full? Why don't you lift your hands and bless him for that? Come on, you know what it is to eat and, and your stomach is hurting because you're so full. You need to bless the Lord thy God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, now go to what he says. Amen to verse 18. Listen to what he's saying in verse 18 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Um, and he said now, and actually in verse 17, he warns Israel. And he tells them, listen, lest your heart, I want to paraphrase this because I want you to understand the way he's wording this. He talks about the fact, lest your heart become exalted and you think that it's by the increase of your might and your arm that you have produced these things. Look at verse 18. He said, but you shall remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that gives you power. Somebody say power. He gives you power to obtain wealth. Everyone say power. Power means ability. It is God that actually gives you the ability to get money. So whatever money you got, remember God gave you the ability to get it. That's why when God asks for it, don't look at God like he's crazy. That's why, that's why as we, we didn't finish 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the latter portion. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the latter portion of the verse, that God loveth a cheerful. God don't love a giver. He, does not, he only likes one type of giver. Everyone shout cheerful. He don't like givers. Some of you are very giving, but you give with strings attached. You give so you can pull on favors later. Well, I did this for you. The least you could do is do this for me. God don't like you. He, 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 he don't like you at all. Some of you parents, you manipulate by giving. You pull guilt trips on your children and other people through your giving. 
See, God, God, God doesn't like that kind of giving. God loveth a what? Now, that word cheerful means hilarious, exuberant, excited. God only loves one type of giver, somebody who's excited to give to him, someone who's exuberant to give to him, somebody that does it with some joy and some passion. Woo, thank you for letting me give to you. Somebody shout, it's a privilege. It's an honor. I'm telling you, we're amazing people. We pay big bucks for a whole lot of stuff and then come to church and want to pinch a penny to make it scream. Huh? We want to shortchange God. We want to look at God like, well, you don't really need it no ways. I can tell you what a lot of us do. It's like this one man, a preacher told him, you need to give your money to God. He said, I will, sir. I'm going to do it tonight. So he went home, threw his money up in the air. Came back, and the preacher asked him, did you give your money to God? I sure did, and I only kept what he didn't take. Some of y'all want to play games with God. Uh-huh. You got to learn to give with a, someone say, with a cheerful heart. When you're asked to do something, ask God to help you to do it cheerfully. Cheerfully. Because you want God to be cheerful in giving to you. I'm telling you, some of y'all are something. You want God to protect you. You want God to protect your children. You want God to bless you. You want God to do this and, and actually get mad at God if you think he's not doing it. But then anything God asks you to do, you got attitude. You don't want to cooperate. Your flesh is so strong. I don't want to do it. I don't like this. Why do I got to do it? I don't see so-and-so got to do it. God said, am I really asking that much from you? Am I really asking so much from you? Don't you recognize? Listen, when you read certain articles, I'll never forget, I was reading this article about various artists, and they were asking them and interviewing them questions, and many of these artists had run, won Grammys, and they were asked, what was the greatest thing that ever happened to you in your career? And it was amazing. If any of these artists ever played before the President of the United States or played before the Queen of England, it was greater than any Grammy or greater than any other award. They always stated that the greatest event of their life was playing before royalty or playing before dignitary and before some sort of dignitary. The world's got better understanding of the church. Don't you understand you're playing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Don't you understand that when you come to church, you have a right to sing before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and now you don't want to sing, and now you don't want to open up your mouth, and now you don't want to give your talents, and now you don't want to participate? Don't you recognize the privilege and the honor? Psalm 65, verse 5, or excuse me, verse 4. Psalm 65, verse 4. Listen to David explain this. Psalm 65, verse 4. Hear David break this thing down. Blessed is the man whom the Lord chooses and causes to approach. Do you understand that you are blessed? The fact that God has chosen you to be here caused you means he enabled you to come. You didn't just come, honey, because you're so spiritual. You didn't just come because you got such a prayer life. You didn't come because you're just so consecrated. Let me tell you why you came. Because God first selected you, then God enabled you to be here. And the fact that God did that for you, you ought to recognize the privilege and the honor of being in the presence. And if you recognize that privilege, honey, you won't give more effort every place else than to God. Amen. Fight all day long to work so you can get good reviews. Proud over the reviews you get. Fight to do the stuff you need to do around the house. But when you come to church, no fight to stay awake. No fight to do the things of God. Why do you take God's energy and give it everywhere else and then won't even give it to the one who gave it to you? Come on and lift your hands and give him some glory right now. We need a mind change. 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 Bethel, we need a mind change. Children of God, we need a mind change. Now, in case you don't know it, we're in deadly times right now. Spirit of the Lord was talking to me and telling me, he said, You're, we're walking across landmines right now. You understand the concept of walking across a landmine? The ground 
looks normal. But wrong, one wrong step and you will blow up. And God said that's the kind of situations we're in right now. Situations, normal situations that you're used to responding certain ways to. If you do not acknowledge the Lord, you will blow up. The situation will blow up in your face and things will blow up right before you. Amen. That's why God's telling you, I need you to think like me now. Christianity is a way of living. It's not just something you do to ease your bleeding conscience to say, I've come to church. God has no interest in your halo being held up by your horns. See, what God is looking for is somebody who will live a submitted life with joy. With joy. Say amen. All right, now let's come back to Galatians chapter 4, and let's go now deeper into what the Apostle Paul is teaching. We've already dealt with verse 1 and 2 of Paul talking about the heir, as long as he's a child, he differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Now, I want you to come down a little bit further to verse 8. Verse 8 of chapter 4. Listen to this. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. In other words, when you didn't understand who God was, you served the devil. Anybody know what he's talking about? See, that's why God, that's why God looks at us sometimes, because you know in the world, you know you didn't step out your house till 10. 10 at night. Now, now you know got saved, and now all of a sudden you got to get your sleep. We got to be done by 9. Yeah, yeah. Now, you see, see, he said, now, when you were in the world, you gave service to the devil. You gave your energy. You gave your time to the enemy. And thought nothing of it. Go, to, go home, change, shower, and go to work. Some you didn't even change. Some you just went straight to the job. Amen. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, you come to church, and now you're a clock watcher. He said, now, you gave all this service to the devil. Don't shortchange God. Your prayer needs to be simple. God, the way I serve the enemy, I want to serve you. Now, listen to what he goes on to say, verse 9. But now, after that, you have known God or rather are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to go into bondage? And he goes down to the fact that you go into the Sabbath day and you, you keep holy days and you're keeping Judaism. But what he's also trying to tell them is once you have learned the things of God and you've learned that they work, why do you go back to the things of the flesh that you know don't work? Does anybody know prayer works? Can I see the hand of you that prayer works? All right, then here's what he's trying to say. You know prayer works. Why are you going back to worry? Why are you going back to the weak, beggarly elements of the world? Why are you turning back to stuff that you know doesn't work? And why aren't you using the stuff that you know works? We got to clarify some of this. Let's let, uh, <laughs> um, see, because you know what some of you do? I tell you, play some games with God. You, you used to folk asking you, did you pray about it? So you know what you do? You pray about it. So someone asks you, did you pray? Yeah, I prayed about it. Okay, let me tell you the, the, the real question you got to ask folk. Did you get an answer? Because see, what a lot of folk do, they'll pray about it. They ain't get no answer. That means they can do what they want to do. See, why are you going back to the weak, beggarly elements of the world? 
Why are you turning back? Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the latter portion of the verse. Romans chapter 14, verse 23, the latter portion of the verse. See, Paul is trying to tell the church, you have got to stay on course with what you have been taught because you know it works. Romans chapter 14, verse 23. Hear the apostle Paul on this. I'm in the latter portion of the verse. He says, whatsoever is not of faith is, wow. All right, I, I, hold on. So then I guess we've got to ask the question, is worry a sin? <laughs> well, is worry faith? Well, whatsoever is not of faith is? Now, 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 let's qualify because God knows us at our levels. If you're a newborn baby, you've not been saved long in God, you're trying to learn God, God has patience and mercies with that. But, honey, when God's answered prayer after prayer after prayer, and you've got yourself a catalog of answered prayers, and now you choose to worry, Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe you've never had somebody do that to you. Maybe you've never had a friend who you've always been there for, and all of a sudden they call you up all frantic. Like, are you going to really be there for me? Like, no, calm down. I've always been there. Why are you acting like this? You're actually insulted. And that's the way God gets after a while. He gets insulted. I've always been there. If I wasn't there, you wouldn't be here to say this now. Now you're going to act like you don't know whether I'm going to show up or not? Now you're going to act like you don't know whether I'm going to answer prayer or not? Hallelujah. Now you don't know whether I, I, I got this or not? See, that, that gets insulting after a while. You that have walked with him long enough, worry is sin. That's why Paul is trying to tell us, you've got to change the way you're thinking here. You've got to change the way you're seeing stuff. You've got to stop going back to the beggarly elements of the world. All right, look at Job chapter 3, verse 25. Job chapter 3, verse 25. Watch this, watch this. Hear, hear Job break this down now. Job is going to explain something to us. Job chapter 3, verse 25. I'm going to give you time to get there because I know, you know, we, we, some of us, we learn in our Bible. So that's all right. Job chapter 3, verse 25, you know, in the beginning of the Bible, there's an order of the books of the Bible, so just to help you out. All right, so now, <clears throat> I'm being nice, you know, because I really was going to say turn to Hezekiah chapter 2 and watch a lot of you start flipping. So, <laughs> some of you are, I can find that, I'm sure you can, because it's not in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Job chapter 3, verse 25. Listen to Job talk now. Job said, the thing which I've greatly feared has what? And the thing that I was afraid of has come. Now, now are, are you understanding what Job's saying? Job was afraid of losing his children. See, Job said that he would offer up sacrifice for his children lest they curse God in their heart. Well, what would happen if you curse God in your heart? You would die. He was afraid of that. So, what ended up happening? He lost his children. What he was afraid of. See, fear calls for these things to happen to you. That's why the devil wants you to be afraid. He wants you to have a free fear of failure. Why? You're calling failure. He wants you to be afraid to mess up. Why? Because you're going to mess up. You're calling it. He wants you to be afraid you're going to miss that note. Why? Because you're going to miss that note. You're calling it. It's coming to you. That's why God wants you to get rid of fear. Uh huh. That's why God doesn't want you to have fear of man. That's why God doesn't want you to have fear of failure, fear of being hurt, fear of the future, fear of the unknown. Mm -hmm. That's why God's saying, don't you understand that when you're afraid, you're calling these things into manifestation. You're actually authorizing the devil to manifest this stuff in your life. You're giving him access. See, you see, when you see stuff correctly, you understand that God's just trying to take care of you. That's all he's trying to do. He's not trying to hurt you. He's just trying to take care of you. 
If he's calling you forward to do something and you're afraid, don't you understand? Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. We covered this yesterday, but let me give a little deeper explanation. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. And let's get a little better understanding on this. Uh, the Apostle Paul, again, speaking. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Paul said, I want you to stir up the gift that you've received from the laying on of my hands. Now, and then verse 7, for God's not given us a spirit of fear. Now, what Paul is trying to tell Timothy, what's going to stop you from stirring up your gift, meaning using your gift, is the spirit of fear. Now, have you ever noticed that whenever you go to move to do something, all of a sudden fear hits you? Because fear comes to shut you down. See, some of you, you're really, you're really amazing. Some of you, you're bold as long as you're moving in your carnality. If you're joking, if you're playing around with folk, you loud, you bold. But now when it comes to God, come up and read a scripture, we can't even hear you. Where, where'd the boldness go? Why are you only bold for the things of the devil? Why are you bold for carnality? Why? I'll tell you why. Because fear hits you and you give into it. It shuts your gift down. All right, all right. Just Revelation chapter 21. Y'all making me go here tonight. Revelation chapter 21. Look what he said now, verse 7, verse 7. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Here, here, the apostle John talk about this now. Verse 7, Revelation 21, verse 7. Here, the apostle John talk about this now. Because John's going to put this in perspective for us. He's going to help us with this. This is why the devil wants you to have this way of thinking. The, you know why some of you are having a hard time obeying God? You're afraid that if you obey him, you're afraid of losing yourself. You're afraid of losing your own identity. <laughs> Let me step a little closer for this one. Uh, because what God is trying to get across to you. Now, I, I know you think you all that in a bag of chips. I know you think you're the main meal and the snack on the side. Okay, but what God is trying to say to you is, even if you were to lose your identity to gain my identity, is not my identity greater than yours? Why are you acting like you're getting robbed? See, that's the carnal mind. Why are you acting like that by you being absorbed into me is somehow a deficit for you? What kind of insulting nature is that? I'm giving you the privilege of a lifetime to be a part of the king of kings and the lord of lords, and you want to hold back in reserve because you're afraid you might lose some aspect of your personality as if that's such a great thing compared to me. Give your neighbor a high five and say, how are you thinking? My God, what's going on with your thinking? That's why sometimes you hear me say this, sometimes we need a checkup from the neck up for some stinking thinking. You've got to alter your way you're thinking. You've got to stop letting the devil convince you that doing the things of God is so hard. How to, and some of you say that. It's hard to live for God. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard it so much. It's hard, it's hard being a Christian. It, it's hard. So much you can't do. So many places you can't go. It's hard living for God. Jesus said my yoke is. Burden is. Somebody lying. Okay, hold on. Hold your place in Revelation. Go to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, because maybe you're not lying. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, latter portion of the verse. Maybe you're not lying. Maybe I got it wrong. I have no problem with repenting. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, latter portion of the verse. The way of the transgressors Okay, so maybe you're, not, maybe you're not lying. Maybe that's why it's hard for you. See, it only gets hard when you start transgressing. It only gets hard when you want to do stuff your way. That's when it's going to get hard. 
You want to sit in God's house. You know, some of y'all are funny. Some of you are funny. If you don't get what you want from God or you don't feel like you got a prayer answered, you will sit in the house of God and act like a two-year-old. I'm going to hold my breath. You hold your breath. You hold your praise. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. You hold your praise. You had a bad day today. Somebody told you off something. You come in the house of God, sit in his face, and hold your breath. You hold your praise. And you know how what you got to do when a baby holds its praise? You got to kind of spank them. That's why God let stuff start spanking you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you want to get mad at God. I don't understand. I serve the Lord. I'm faithful. The Lord came to me today. He said, you know, a lot of folk who claim to be faithful, you need to find out what they're faithful to in. Because some of them are faithful to rebel. They're faithful to do what I told them not to do. They're faithful in just a few things. They give their tithes, their offerings, and they think that covers faithfulness in every area. And they show up to church, and that's supposed to cover faithfulness. But they're, they're faithful in wrong attitudes. They're faithful in murmuring and complaining. They're faithful in not praising and not worshiping. See, you need to be faithful in the things of God. Tell you never be faithful in the things of God. You need to be faithful to the things of God. Revelation 21, verse 7. Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Now, he said, to he that overcometh, you will inherit all things. And I'll be his God. He'll be his, I'll be, you'll be his son. Verse 8. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, the whoremonger. And he goes down through a list of names. He said, they shall all have their part in the lake of fire, which Did, did, did you see the first ones going to the lake of fire? Who? Not, not, not adulterers, not fornicators. Not murderers. First ones going to the lake of fire. See, that's why the devil wants you to be fearful. He wants you to be fearful to get up. He wants you to be fearful to lead testimony service. Some of you, some of you, some of you actually are sitting there going, God, please don't call me. Please don't let him call me. Please don't let him call me. Please, Lord. I'll, I'll praise you tonight. I love on you, God. Please don't let him call me. Praying to get out of the work of the Lord. Bless your palpitating heart. Lord, you know I forget names. And Lord, I don't remember this person. And Lord, I don't know how to sing well. Please don't let him call me. First one's going to the lake of fire. Now let's understand why. Let's understand why. Why would God send the fearful first? Remember the number one commandment. Thou shall have no other gods before me. So fear, remember what we said in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, that it's the spirit of fear. So fear is a spirit. Not a feeling, a spirit. So when you keep Bowing to the will of the spirit of fear. Remember the word worship also means to bow. Whatever you keep bowing to, you are worshiping. And whatever you're worshiping, that's your God. And whoever your God is, that's your reward. So when you keep bowing to the spirit of fear, fear tells you, God says, come on, son, come on, daughter, lift your hands, open up your mouth, pray. Fear says you better sit here and act like you know. Folk don't think you crazy. You better sit here. And you listen to the spirit of fear. You bow your will to that spirit. I'm not talking about just once or twice. I'm talking about your bowing, your worshiping. You keep living at its altars. Therefore, you end up with its reward, which is lake of fire. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Reason with me now. Reason with me a moment. Go, go back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Reason with me. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Let, 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 let's see something together, shall we? Let's gain some understandings here. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. All right. Uh, I want to make sure you see these things, so I'm trying to slow down a little bit just so you've got time to turn to these scriptures. I want you to see this. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 
For fear has torment, and he that feareth has not been made perfect in love. Did you catch that middle part? Fear has... Don't you understand that fear gives you a foretaste of where you're going? Everyone say fear has torment. Now, the, the concept of that word torment is particularly dealing with the word punishment. See, that's why a lot of you are afraid. You're afraid because I'm going to get hurt. It's like I'm going to get punished. I, 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 I'm afraid because people are going to laugh at me. They're going to say something about me. I'm afraid. I'd rather sit in the background. Don't you understand you are already living the torment that is yet to come? See, here's the way fear does. Fear plays these games. It acts like your friend. It acts like your confidant. Fear says if you'll just listen to me, you won't get hurt. So you know what? You listen to the fear. And what? guess what? It seems to work. You don't get hurt. But by doing this, you have now disobeyed God and made fear your God. And fear will let you miss out on certain things just to make sure you're being set up for eternal punishment. I'll let you miss out on a little bit of pain here to make sure I can set you up for eternal pain over there. Uh -huh. Somebody lift your hand and say, I serve only one God. And say, the spirit of fear is not that God. Say, Jesus is my only God. Say, my flesh is not my God. My feelings are not my God. My opinion is not my God. Jesus is my only God. We can't just preach one God as a doctrine. We've got to live one God as a lifestyle. Say amen to that. Come on, just lift your hands a moment and just glorify him a moment. Ah, come on, you've got to stop turning back to the beggarly elements of the world. Stop turning back to the beggarly elements. Come on, you know praise works. You know prayer works. You know shouting works. You know dancing works. You know glorifying God works. Stop giving into your feelings of the flesh. Stop giving into the moods of the flesh. I'm telling you, some of you are buying some stuff that you should not be buying. Look, look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. I, I can't move past this beggarly elements yet because God said there's too many of you in this house. You keep using beggarly elements. You keep going back to stuff that God told you does not work. And then got the nerve to get mad at God when you get the results of what God said you were going to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Be careful. For what? Everybody say careful. Now, that word careful means don't be worried, anxious, nervous about anything. See, those of you that have bought the slide of the devil, that have, especially those of you that have children, well, I, I love you. That's why I worry about you. God is love, and God does not worry. So how does your love worry? Oh, because in case you don't know, worry is fear. The reason why you're worried, you're afraid something bad is going to happen. Worry is fear. Worry is the interest that you pay on trouble before you get it. Worry is fear. And perfect love casts out fear. So then how can worry be love? They are opposites. I'm worried about my grandchildren because I want them saved. Now what kind of oxymoron is this? You worried about your grandchildren because you want them saved. You want to use a tool that's opposite to God 
and expect salvation to be the end result? How'd that work? See, you keep going back to the beggarly elements. You keep using stuff that God tells you, leave it alone. And, and then you're wondering why you're getting the results you're getting. Well, if I'm not supposed to worry, what am I supposed to do? Philippians 4 and 6, be careful for nothing, but by prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You're supposed to pray. You're supposed to thank him. Supplication means passionate prayer. Pray with some passion, baby. Pray with some intensity. And you're supposed to pray thanking him for what he's already done. Then verse 7. See, how long do I pray to? People say, well, how long do I pray to? Till you reach verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Pray till you have peace about it. When do I stop praying about that thing? When I get peace about it. When God gives me the peace that it's all right now, when God settles into my spirit, ah, I got this thing covered. Ah, I, 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 I'm settled. I'm secure in that thing. It will keep. That word keep means it will form a garrison or a fortress around your heart, that's your emotions, and around your mind, that's your intellect. So you pray until your mind and your emotions are at peace. Let me break it down a little further because what the devil tries to do is to bring you into the civil war, the north versus the south. The north, your intellect. The south, your emotions. So he tries to bring you into an internal civil war. So it's only God that can give the peace treaty who will reconcile your mind and your emotions. My mind's telling me one thing. My emotions is telling me another thing. My mind is telling me that we shouldn't trust no more. But my emotions is telling me I need love. My mind tells me you're stupid. You've already gotten hurt. My emotion says, but we got to try one more time because this is the way I'm, I'm designed. I need love. And so you got this civil war going on and you don't even know who to listen to. But friend, if you'll pray till you have peace. Tell somebody, pray till you receive peace. Uh-huh. You got to pray till you receive peace. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, God. Go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You've got to understand something now about peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Because I want to tell you why a lot of you are struggling. Because you're back to the beggarly elements of the world. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. You've got to catch this now. For unto us a child is born. We know this is talking about the birth of Jesus. Unto us, a son is given. Watch this. Watch this. And the government shall be upon. Why is it on your shoulders then? How come you're always trying to figure out how to take care of your bills? That's why some of you right now on a second and third job. Trying to work part time. Trying to figure out how to pay off your bills. How, how come you got the government on your shoulders? See, how come you always want control of your life? How come you never want to give up the steering wheel? And even those of you that give up the steering wheel, you learned how to be a backseat driver. Come on, haven't you ever ridden with Pope that got an invisible brake? <laughs> They got, that, they, they got that invisible break on their side. Stop! Like that's supposed to do something, right? And see, that's the way many of you are with God. You, 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 you give God the wheel, but then you want to tell him how to drive. The government shall be upon. Tell your neighbor, put the government back on his shoulders. Tell him it don't belong on my shoulders and don't belong on your shoulders. See, I want to tell you why a lot of you are doing this. You're control freaks. Some of you are control freaks. Ooh, Jesus. Now, now, now it's nice to be neat and clean, but some of y'all control freaks. 
And see, a lot of this comes from hurt. Because you can't, see, what you learn is the reason why I was hurt was because I couldn't control something. So if I can be in control, then I can minimize getting hurt or stop it altogether. So that's why you got to control first your environment by everything being absolutely spick and span neat until the fact that you are just almost driving everybody crazy. If someone just moves a salt, just a meter where you keep it. Look, don't come in my kitchen, all right? Just don't, don't bother stuff in my kitchen. Control freaks. Now, if you're a controller, see, the word Lord speaks of being controller. How is he Lord over your life and you in control? Anything with two heads is a freak. See, God designed this world and everything got one head. I don't care if you're talking about a bunny rabbit, you're talking about a fox. Everything got one head. Amen? Uh-huh. See, when, when, when things have two heads, they, they tell you that's a freak. Something genetically is wrong. Mm-hmm. So how do you expect Jesus to be the head while you're in control of everything? And, oh, can I go a little deeper? Jesus has issues with some of you anyways because you're such a control freak about having your house neat while your spiritual house is dirty. You want him to live in something you ain't living in. Everything got to be in place and in order in your house while everything's out of order in his house. And see, so what God says now, you got to give me back the controls. Stop going to the beggarly element. Stop telling me what you're not going to do. Some of you actually have the nerve to tell God what you're not going to do. Now, now, some of you wouldn't even do your parents like that because you know what happened. Say that again, brother. It gets tore up. Just. Huh? You know exactly what happened if you would tell your parents no, or I don't think I want to do that, or I'm not in the mood to do that. As I heard one grandmother say to a child, if you won't hear, you won't feel. So I'll jump down your throat and tap dance on your liver. Come on, parents, you know the saying. I brought you in here. Now, in case you don't know, that's God saying too. Where do you think you got it from? You got that from the Lord. All right, all right. Daniel chapter 5, so you can see it. Go to verse 20, Daniel chapter 5, go to verse 20. Or excuse me, verse 23. We'll go to verse 23. Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. I want you to see this. Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. Listen to this, see, because here's the problem we're having. We keep going to the beggarly elements. Daniel chapter 5, verse 23. I want the latter portion of the verse. Because in the first part, Daniel's talking. He's telling King Nebra, uh, uh, Belshazzar, you've praised the gods of gold and silver. And, you know, you've drank to the, in these cups. You've drank in the cups of the Lord. Now listen to what he says. But the God who knew all thy ways. You haven't acknowledged him. In fact, watch what he says. The God in whose hand thy breath is, thou hast not glorified. About to close your hand like this. Did you sweat? Any beads, any beads of sweat come on your forehead? Any, any sweat in your hand? God said, that's how easy it is for me to take your life. Because your breath is in. And I gave you breath, and I can. I know you think you're Superman, but remember, every Superman got kryptonite. See, guys, I can just close my hand. Game over. 
And so that's why God said, I want you to understand now, I need you to work with me. I need you to recognize that I am God. Anybody recognize that he's God? If you recognize that he's God right now, lift your hands to him and open up your mouth to him. And somebody needs to start to declaring to him, I'm not going back to the beggarly elements of the world. I'm, I'm not going to do these things anymore. Come on. I'm not going to do these things anymore. Come on. Stop going back to the beggarly elements. Stop going back to the beggarly elements. Stop going back to the beggarly elements. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, verse 27. Listen to what he's saying. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Listen to Paul with this. Be ye angry, but sin not. Now, I, I, please catch this. Some of you, the reason why you're struggling, because you really don't have God's mind. You're trying to, you find that you have a temper, and you're trying to get rid of your anger, and you're not able to get rid of it. In fact, the more you try to get rid of it is sometimes the more angry you find you get. Let me tell you why. It's because God actually told you to be angry. Anger comes from God because God gets angry. Yeah, he gets angry. Uh, the anger comes from God. Here's the key. Sin not. Don't let your anger go through your flesh. Let your anger go through your spirit. See, God wants you angry. He wants you angry at spiritual forces. The reason why many of you are struggling, you get angry at yourself. You get angry at flesh and blood, and you get angry at others. You get frustrated with people rather than getting frustrated and angry with spiritual forces. God said channel that thing towards spiritual forces. Don't get rid of it. I want it. I want you to get angry. I want you to get angry at the devil because whoever you're angry at is who you're blaming, and whoever you're blaming is who you'll fight. So I want you angry at the devil so that you'll blame the devil so that you'll fight the devil. Say yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, no, don't let your son, don't let, don't, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. He said, neither give place to the devil. So he, what he's trying to tell you is. Don't go back to these beggarly elements and the use of these beggarly elements, whereby you are used to using these things through your flesh, use them through your spirit, and gain an access into the holy of holies and conquer the things of the enemy. Don't allow the devil to make you double-minded. Do you remember what James said in James chapter 1? He said, a double-minded man is unstable in in all of his ways. What he's actually trying to tell you is that many of you are not going to receive from the Lord because the verse above, James chapter 1, he starts amen around verse 7. Verse 7, he says, that man is not going to receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8 is that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. He says, now listen, don't you understand that when you're double-minded, you're not getting anything from the Lord. So in one moment, you start praying and reading and doing the things of God. The next moment, you start fearing and worrying and moving in unbelief. You say, well, I did pray for a while. Won't God bless me? God said, no, you were double-minded. 
you jump minds. You jump from your carnal mind, from your spiritual mind to your carnal mind. And you keep jumping back and forth. And, and, and you go from mood to mood. One moment you want to praise me. You want to kiss all over me. You want to love me. The next moment you want to look at me like I'm crazy. The one moment you want to do what I say. You want to do it with joy. The next moment you want to act like I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a hardship and I'm punishing you because I'm asking you to do something. Double-minded. Listen, I feel the spirit of repentance right now in this house. God is calling somebody to say, I will not keep walking in my carnal mind. I will not keep walking in my flesh. I will not keep going back to the beggarly elements of the world. Come on, as you're lifting your hands right now, I hear the Holy Ghost making the call. I hear the Holy Ghost making the call. I hear the Holy Ghost making the call. Come on. This altar is open for those of you right now that you know you need to take some time to pray. Some of you need to repent. You need to tell God, I'm so sorry for dictating to you. I'm so sorry for living by my flesh. I'm so sorry for going back to the beggarly elements of the world. I'm so sorry for trying to do things my way. I'm sorry for doing things my way, thinking that my way is actually better than your way. I'm sorry. I'm asking you to help me to submit. Come on, some of y'all sitting there looking at God like you don't have a clue of what he's talking about, and you know you're strong-willed, and you know you're telling God what you don't want to do. Come on, come on, come on. The beggarly elements, the beggarly elements. I, I'm, I'm not doing it no more. I'm not doing it no more. I'm not doing it anymore. Come on, there's some others right now. The Holy Ghost is talking to you. There's some others. There's some others right now. The Lord's calling you. Come on, the Lord tells you what he wants you to do. And if you don't like it, you kick, you scream. It's all about you, what you don't like, how upset you are, why it's got to be like that. Come on, you've got to obey the Lord with joy. The Lord's calling more people right now. The Lord's calling, the Lord's calling. There's some more of you right now. I don't know why some of you are staying in your seats, because some of you I can literally pull you up by the Spirit. And tell you. Because <laughs> you ain't going to do stuff when you don't want to do it. And if you do it, you ain't going to do it with joy. Come on, some of you. You're called up to song lead, called up to do something. You don't want to do it. You're going to hold the mic down by your stomach. You're going you're gonna to not be involved. You're going you're gonna to whisper. You're going to make sure you ain't heard. You're going you're gonna to be up there with a sour look on your face. you Come on, you need, to, you need to talk to God. Come on, you need to talk to God. You need to deal with the beggarly elements. Come on. I want to submit my will to, with joy to your will. That's right, that's right. Yeah, thank you, Lord Jesus. My God, begin to minister in this house right now. Begin to minister in this house right now. Thank you for it right now. You're calling for people. You're calling for people. You're speaking. You're calling right now. You're calling right now. Thank you right now. You're calling. I'm getting ready to pray right now. If anybody else is coming, you're coming right now. Because when I start praying, nobody else move because I don't want you to interrupt the flow of the Spirit by your walking. So if you're coming, you're coming right now. And when I start praying, nobody else come. All right, lift your hands to the Lord right now. We're going to begin to pray.